Patrolling space like a sentry, the satellite telescope SWIFT is on constant lookout for cosmic disasters. And when it finds one, down on Earth, word spreads quickly. Every few days, the satellite spots a violent eruption in deep space, sending dozens of stargazers scrambling. Whether they're seasoned pros or high school amateurs, their goal is the same. Go to camera focus mode, then we're going to need to move the dome. Casey? To catch a glimpse of a star in its final death throes. Going supernova. And leaving in its wake the strangest phenomenon in the cosmos. A black hole. Nothing survives encounters with black holes. The black hole wins. It wins every time. When something falls into a black hole, it's essentially gone from our universe. They rip stuff apart and eat them. And then they burp, and they're ready for the next course. And now, evidence of something even more ominous, a new kind of black hole of unfathomable size and power. That's a big galaxy, and right down at the center, we think there's probably a black hole that's got a mass you know, that approaches a billion suns. Today, scientists are finding black holes are bigger, stronger, and more destructive than they ever imagined. It creates energy fields that would fry any life in its vicinity. Not only do they consume everything that comes near, you stick your finger down in there, you ain't getting it back. But their power may reach across galaxies and beyond. Did the universe really have to be made with these things in it? We'd like to think they're far, far away. But what if, in our own cosmic backyard, there lurks the monster of the Milky Way? Right now on Nova. <laughs> This is just enormous. That's As he pours over a set of x-rays, Brian McNamara struggles to diagnose a complicated ailment. So that's pretty strange. But his patient isn't a person or any earthly creature. It's a cluster of galaxies, two and a half billion light years away, with a giant blast of energy spewing from the center. This is the most powerful explosion in the universe since the Big Bang. To put this on sort of an Earth scale, it's equivalent to about a trillion, trillion, trillion atomic explosions. So it's an enormous amount of energy. What could produce such awesome power? Whatever it is, it seems to live at the very core of galaxies. And many believe our own galaxy, the Milky Way, is not immune, harboring a powerful secret at its heart. What could lie at the center of the Milky Way? One of the pioneering explorers of our galaxy is Eric Becklin. He's been trying to unlock the mysteries of the galactic center for more than 40 years. But first, he had to find it. Back then, people weren't even sure where the center was. There was some vague understanding. There was a radio source called Sagittarius A, a very strong radio source. But there was even debate whether that was really the center or not. Examining other distant galaxies, astronomers knew that the center is usually the brightest spot, tightly packed with stars. But when they tried to pinpoint the center of our own galaxy, the Milky Way, they ran into a problem. The central stars were shrouded by cosmic dust. There is so much dust between us and the galactic center, it is completely opaque. You do not see the stars in the galactic center. The most powerful telescopes cannot see it. 
But there are other kinds of light that can pass through, like infrared, a form of light and heat invisible to the naked eye that travels in slightly longer waves. Infrared radiation gets through the dust because its wavelengths are longer and the dust just kind of rides on the infrared wave. In the 1960s, Becklin belonged to a Caltech team that bought an infrared detector from a military contractor and attached it to the end of a telescope. It was in August of 1966. I was up at Mount Wilson. It was a beautiful night on a small 24-inch telescope. And as we were looking uh, with the infrared detector, we were seeing more and more stars. A simple chart recorded the infrared light of stars, stars that until then had remained hidden behind a veil of dust and debris. This is a signal in the infrared, and each star gives you more signal. And we were building up, as we were getting closer to the center, more and more stars. We were actually seeing through the dust for the first time, and then came to a peak, and then back down again. And I knew immediately that that was the center of our Milky Way, and that I was the first person to actually see the star in the core of our galaxy. Ben located the heart of the Milky Way. From our perspective, an inconspicuous speck near the constellation Sagittarius. Where is a giant spiraling disk of hundreds of billions of stars, a hundred thousand light years from end to end. Our sun, about halfway out from the center, sits in the peaceful suburbs. But at the galaxy's core, the neighborhood gets more exciting and dangerous. There's a lot of gas. There's a lot of dust. This is absolutely the most crowded place in our galaxy. From Earth, we can see a few thousand stars with the naked eye. If you went to the galactic center, there would be millions of stars filling the sky. It's the big time. It's where the show really goes on in the galaxy. And so if you go there, you're very much aware of being a, a tiny little mouse in Times Square and somebody's liable to step on you. For years, scientists suspected that a powerful force dominated this galactic Times Square. It had to come from an unimaginably massive object. Some thought it had to be a black hole. An object so strange, it's hard to describe. What's a black hole? It's a region of space. It's a point of infinite density. We don't know how to wrap our brains around that. Um, if you fall in, you never come out. It's not the point of no return, it's the sphere of no return. Now you throw in a hungry beast in the middle of it all. It's this monstrous, mysterious thing. And if you can imagine taking a bowling ball that, I don't know, eats everything, that's not true. <laughs> you have something, you drop it off the top of a building, and you're falling in to the deepest well you can possibly imagine. Physicists have just as hard a time as anybody else understanding this sort of thing. It's a black hole. There's no other phrase we can possibly use to describe it. The current idea of this bizarre creature comes from a radical view of space, time, and gravity. Welcome to the universe according to Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein had this crazy idea that space and time were curved and it was the curvature of space that gave the appearance of gravity. We tend to think of space as rigid and stable, but Einstein proposed that space and time are woven together in a flexible fabric. Massive objects like the sun actually bend and warp the fabric of space-time creating troughs that smaller objects can fall into. What actually happens is matter warps space-time. So the very space, the three-dimensional space that we walk through, warps slightly. Every warps in on me ever so slightly, but because we're not very massive, 
it's so minuscule that we don't sense it. If an object is massive enough, like the Earth, it will warp space-time so we can sense it and fall towards it. That's gravity. But what happens if an object is much, much more massive than the Earth or the Sun? In theory, it could warp the fabric so much it would create an actual hole in space-time. Once something fell in, it couldn't escape, not even light itself. So imagine a place where the gravity is so strong, turning on a flashlight. The light would go up and it would never leave. It would curve and come back down just the way a tossed ball on Earth is not traveling fast enough. It goes up, curves, and comes back down. Space itself is falling inside the black hole. It's rather like a, a river falling over a waterfall. It's like that, except it's space itself that's falling over the cliff. There's a place where the space starts moving faster than light. So the light, which is trying to get out, it's rather like a kayaker trying to make their way up stream on a river that's going too fast, they get dragged down to the center of the black hole. Gravity becomes a riptide. The closer you get, the stronger the current. Eventually, you reach the event horizon, the point of no return. Deep inside, whatever goes in is lost in a point of infinite density. The matter goes inside the surface of the black hole, shrinks down to the very center where it gets destroyed in a region of infinite warp space and time, and it's gone. And so, it seems, are the laws of physics. At the center of a black hole, all equations break down. Even for physicists, what happens deep inside a black hole is a mystery. We're in want of a new idea about how to explain what matter does at the center of a black hole. We're in need of a new law of physics. Einstein himself concluded black holes were too strange to be real. Albert never really liked the idea of black holes. He thought they were anathema. This was something that nature should avoid. The places where space and time became infinitely twisted up, he thought, no, nature shouldn't allow that. Black holes are certainly odd beasts in the universe. They were thought to be peculiar, so peculiar as to perhaps not even really exist in the real world. Simply because your equations show that they can exist doesn't require that the real universe has them. But over the years, suspicions rose. Stars were found behaving strangely, orbiting invisible objects, moving faster than expected. Even though a black hole emits no light, is completely invisible, we know exactly what effect a black hole is going to have on its environment, on the stars in its vicinity, on the gas that wanders a little too close. So will we ever see a black hole? No. But that's not what's important here. What's important here is we can see its paw print. Suspicious that an enormous black hole was dominating the center of the Milky Way, Eric Becklin was eager to find its paw print. But even with infrared technology, when Becklin pointed the most powerful telescopes on Earth at his target, all he saw was this, just a blur. The biggest obstacle that we had uh, was the turbulence in the, our own Earth's atmosphere was blurring the images. Even when the sky is clear, the gases in Earth's atmosphere are always on the move, distorting distant objects. To bring his view of the galactic center into focus, Becklin would need help. So he appealed to Andrea Ghez, an expert in dealing with the atmospheric blur. The problems of the Earth's atmosphere is very much like the problem of looking for a penny at the bottom of a river that's moving where the water is moving by very quickly. That motion of the water distorts your image of the penny. Just like the motion of the air in our atmosphere distorts our images of astronomical objects. Gez agreed to take on the quest. 
to search for signs of a black hole at the center of the Milky Way. A decade ago, you couldn't look at the center of our galaxy with high resolution, so you couldn't distinguish stars from one another. Gez was able to correct the blurring effects of the atmosphere with a revolutionary new technology called adaptive optics. So this little animation shows you the benefit of adaptive optics. You see the stars without adaptive optics, you turn the adaptive optics on, and all of a sudden you see stars. And in particular, you see stars near the center of the galaxy. Without adaptive optics, you would only see one big blob. And those stars are, in fact, the most important for us to track. We track all of them, but these are the ones that are the key to the problem. I mean, it doesn't hurt to take them. More Thanks to the new technology, the team could peer into the heart of the Milky Way with amazing precision. Our view to the center of the galaxy is absolutely superb, and our ability to position stars at the center of the galaxy is like somebody in Los Angeles seeing somebody in New York be able to move their finger like this, okay, just two centimeters. That's the precision with which we can measure something that is 26,000 light years away from us. Once the view was clear, Gez could start the hunt. If there were a black hole at the center of the galaxy, its paw print would be found in the rapid orbits of nearby stars. Keep our fingers crossed. The conclusive experiment to be done that really demonstrated that it was a black hole is to follow the orbits of individual stars in the galactic center very, very accurately and with the highest precision possible. When an object like a star approaches another more massive object, the pull of gravity will make the star speed up. If it's orbiting close to a massive black hole, the star should accelerate to enormous speed and then whip around the black hole like a slingshot. Okay, so we have the black hole here. Uh, the more massive it is, the more pull there is. The more pull there is, as it gets close to the black hole, the faster it goes. And we are measuring the speed of these stars. That's the key to getting the masses, measuring the speed of those stars. This is our road map, and that's the center of our galaxy. There's a large cluster of stars that are orbiting the center of our galaxy, and by measuring the motion of stars, and in particular um, their orbits, uh, we can figure out whether or not there's a central black hole. That environment in there, it's a crowded party. Gez set out to monitor the partygoers, to track every movement of the central stars. Basically, the way this experiment works is you take an image, you see where all the stars are, and then uh, you come back some time later and you take another image, and you look to see if they've moved. And so the, the second time we took an image, we knew we were golden. Those stars had clearly moved. This one moved to here, this one moved to here, this one moved to here, and so on. As Gez continued to track the stars, she found some making dramatic hairpin turns. It made a huge jump to over here. So it went whoop, all the way around. And it's moving on order 10 million miles per hour. So it's just speeding away. Other astronomers clocked the stars with similar results. Not only were the stars accelerating to phenomenal speeds, their orbits were perfectly smooth. Gez knew that they had to be circling a single massive object. Most black holes are thought to be about 10 times more massive than our sun. But the object at the center of the Milky Way was roughly 3 million times as massive. For Gez and Becklin, that could mean only one thing. All other physical explanations of uh, what was at the very center uh, were gone. The only thing left was a black hole. Not only was this black hole supermassive, it was millions of miles wide. Astronomers around the world admitted the evidence was impressive. I have to say, when I first saw Andrea's video, I was stunned when I saw that star come out of the left side of the frame and go zipping around and go shooting off into the other end of the frame, and it moved around a point in space, and nothing was there that we could, with our instruments, 
effectively travel to the center of the galaxy 26,000 light years away and collect the evidence for such an incredible object. It was, it was really an amazing achievement. It seemed undeniable, a giant black hole and at the center of our Milky Way. But how could such a monstrosity come to be? One idea is that black holes are born out of the death throes of enormous stars. Like a red supergiant, a star 10 times more massive than our own sun. Deep inside, temperatures soar above a billion degrees. Helium and carbon fuse into heavier elements. Oxygen, silicon, sulfur. Eventually, the nuclear reaction creates iron, and the core stops burning. Then, the star implodes under its own immense gravity and goes supernova. What's left is a heavy core of subatomic particles, a neutron star, only about 10 miles across, but of incredible density. In fact, it's so dense that a teaspoonful of neutron star matter would weigh about a billion tons. If the neutron star is heavy enough, three times more massive than our sun or more, the implosion will continue. Eventually, the gravitational pressure will be so large that the neutrons themselves will be crushed and there'll be nothing left to stop the collapse. Many researchers believe that the Milky Way is littered with small black holes, the dark, dense remains of dead stars. There must be millions and millions of black holes zipping around our galaxy as we speak, but we don't see them in general because they're dead. They're corpses, and uh, there's nothing there to light them up. They might be invisible, but to a visitor, these small black holes, maybe 10 miles in diameter, would be especially deadly. One of the scenarios that always gets me thinking is death by black hole. Approaching a black hole, the gravity is so strong and space is so warped, it distorts the light all around it. If it's a small black hole, then soon you'll be distorted too by tremendous tidal forces of gravity. The tidal force is the difference between the gravity at your head and your feet. The gravity at your feet, if they're close to the black hole, is a little bit stronger than the gravity at your head, and you feel that as something that is tearing you apart. Stretching you from head to toe, the tidal forces unrelentingly getting stronger as they exceed the molecular forces that bind your flesh as you snap into two pieces, and those two pieces snap into another two pieces. And ultimately, you will pull your atoms apart. You will be, as we say, spaghettified. And so you end up moving through space-time like toothpaste through a tube. And if I pick a way to go, that's how I'd want to go. It's got to be better than just getting buried. I mean, come on now. A supermassive black hole a million times wider, might at first seem more inviting. Since it has a larger event horizon, the pull of gravity is more spread out. If you go to a supermassive black hole, the tidal forces are weak enough that you can fall not only through the event horizon, but deep down into the interior of the black hole. So, with a good spaceship, you might be able to cross the event horizon into the black hole itself. Now, thanks to a computer simulation based on Einstein's own equations, we can see exactly what such a trip would look like. The supermassive black hole is surrounded by swirling light beams as superheated gas rushes into orbit at high speed. Light and matter are suspended by centrifugal force and then inevitably fall victim to the relentless pull of gravity. At last you cross the event horizon, the point
point where nothing can escape. So let, let's imagine that we fall through the event horizon. That's the place where space is moving faster than light. We fall deeper down inside the black hole. But don't expect the black hole to be black. Deep within, there's an inner horizon, a logjam of trapped light and energy. At a certain moment, as we hit the inner horizon, there's this infinitely bright, blinding flash. And that's all the stuff that's been waiting there, trying to get out, is just held there at the inner horizon. Unfortunately, you wouldn't have long to enjoy the view. It would vaporize you, roast you, vaporize you, marmalize you. Almost certainly, if you fell into a real black hole, you would simply, unfortunately, die. Science fiction displays a bit more optimism, like the 1979 movie, The Black Hole. Space travelers do indeed fear this massive object. I will travel where no man has dared to go. Into the black hole? Why, that's crazy. Cuckoo is a Swiss clock. But even more cuckoo, the heroes actually survived their descent into the beast, where they're treated to a heavenly experience. Popular culture has cast black holes as the freaks of the universe. And the supermassive black hole at the center of our Milky Way, weighing in at three million times the mass of the sun, seems especially monstrous. But is it unique? To find out, astronomers are probing distant galaxies to see if our giant black hole is one of a kind, or nothing special. The Sloan Digital Sky Survey is taking a census of the big galaxies within a billion light years. For every patch of sky, a steel plate is created. Each hole represents an entire galaxy within our view. Fiber optic sensors are plugged in. Each measures the distinctive spectrum of light emanating from a galaxy's core and can detect signs of hot gas swirling into a black hole. You can see the results. Circled in red, virtually every major galaxy bears the signature of a supermassive black hole. That was pretty amazing. Before that, we thought, yeah, maybe a large number of galaxies have black holes in them, but every galaxy has a black hole? That was something very interesting. The closer we look to the centers of galaxies, the more we find these black holes, and the inventory is rising high. So any idea for the formation of a galaxy will now have to include some explanation for how you get a black hole in its center. So how did every big galaxy in the universe end up with a giant black hole in the middle? To understand, we have to go back to the very beginning. the Big Bang. You got the Big Bang handing you your birth ingredients, your hydrogen, your helium, your, your traces of some other elements. So it's kind of like this, this soup. You put it together and stir it. The main stirrer for the soup is gravity, drawing together wisps of hot primordial gases over time, the clouds of hydrogen gas cool down and grow more and more dense until some coalesce into the first stars. These are giants, hundreds of times bigger than our sun. They burn out quickly and dramatically in the flash of a supernova. What's left at the core is a black hole. 
Perhaps the black hole becomes the seed from which the galaxy sprouts. The gravitational seed that is used as an attractive force to accumulate the rest of what we would today then call the greater galaxy. Possibly seeded by black holes, the infant galaxies dance and orbit one another as gravity pulls them closer. So our Milky Way galaxy, as this time-lapse simulation shows, was not born in one single event. Instead, it was built over billions of years from a swarm of smaller galaxies smashing together, merging. But if another galaxy comes too close, they will each feel each other's gravity. And in that collision, what started out as a stately ballet of stellar orbits moving around the center of their galaxy has now become this maelstrom. There's no other way to say it. Galactic cannibalism, that's what they're doing. They're dining on their neighbors, eating entire galaxies. Well, for every galaxy you eat, if that galaxy has a black hole in its center, it's going to eat the black hole. The black hole will work its way down to the center of the large galaxy, making the center of the galaxy bigger as well as the galaxy itself. It's just that simple. The big galaxies get bigger, and the little ones get eaten. Galactic cannibalism is how galaxies grow, and with them, the black holes at their centers merge and grow bigger. But what does the presence of such a monster mean for the life of a galaxy? Brian McNamara believes he's found the answer, and it isn't pretty. That's it right there. We got it. That's it. Okay, so you want to go. McNamara studies the life cycles of the universe's biggest structures, galaxy clusters. There it is. That's the galaxy. So that's what we've been looking for. This is the giant central galaxy in a galaxy cluster. Uh, and each one of these little dots here on the screen is a, is a giant galaxy as big as our Milky Way, uh, maybe even a little bit bigger. And they're all bound together by their own mutual gravity. So they're all uh, buzzing around this giant galaxy like bees buzzing around a hive. McNamara probes his galaxies with multiple tools. Optical telescopes, radio receivers, even x-rays. Oh, there we go. Check that out. X-ray images reveal a vast cloud of hot gas through the whole cluster across hundreds of thousands of light years. There's an atmosphere of gas um, that pervades the entire galaxy cluster. And it's an atmosphere like our atmosphere, except that it's far less dense and it's, and it's um, much, much hotter. But when McNamara looked at x-rays of the gas around certain clusters, he saw that vast clumps of it appeared to be missing. I was blown away. I'll never forget the moment we got the observations. And lo and behold, these two giant cavities showed up in the x-ray emission. The size of the cavities was astounding. That's 200,000, 600,000 light years from end to end. So between that cavity here and this cavity here, we could stuff 600 Milky Ways in there. It's just astonishing. The energy involved is huge. Something powerful had pushed the gas away across vast regions of the universe. McNamara traced the power source to the center of a giant galaxy, a supermassive black hole. So we could see the beam coming out of the black hole and ending up in these big cavities. But how can a black hole, a creature famous for devouring everything within its grasp, spew energy across the universe? The answer lies in the way matter falls toward the black hole. It turns out, nothing goes straight in. As matter falls in, um, what we know now is that it spirals around in a disk, okay, very much the way when water goes down the drain. It doesn't just go straight down the drain. Just as water spirals down a drain in a whirlpool, 
matter and light spiral at high speed into a black hole. And the speeds that matter can, can achieve around that black hole approach the speed of light. And when matter travels at that speed, it gets a tremendous amount of energy. Matter falling into a black hole is a lot of stuff trying to get into a very small place. And so it's like trying to fill a dog dish with a fire hose. Most isn't going to get in. The black hole chokes on the influx. And the high-speed whirlpool of matter produces a powerful magnetic field coiling around the black hole and shooting the energy outward. These enormous jets of energy, hundreds of millions of times the power of the sun, can blast right out of the galaxy. There's no question that the black holes at the centers of galaxies have a profound influence on their surrounding. They send out these huge jets moving at almost the speed of light. And those jets can send shock waves into the surrounding medium and change their surroundings completely. They have a dramatic influence. Not only can they blast away huge quantities of gas, but they may even sterilize the galaxy so new stars can't form. The supermassive black holes at the center may be responsible for limiting the size of galaxies. In principle, galaxies can grow um, to very, very large sizes, and what we see in the universe is that they don't. And we think that the supermassive black holes at the center may be the culprit. They may be responsible um, for preventing runaway growth of galaxies. We usually think of black holes as God's dumpster, but they really are actors on the galactic stage. If supermassive black holes can wreak so much havoc, what's to stop our own monster of the Milky Way from wiping us all out? It all depends on the monster's diet. Most of the time, a black hole isn't eating. It fasts more than it feasts. But when a black hole feasts, it can have a tremendous effect on the surrounding galaxy. The more black holes chow down, the more matter and energy will blast outwards. One of the key differences between galaxies with supermassive black holes is whether or not their black holes are lit up because they're basically binging on a lot of material in its surroundings. For years, our black hole seemed to be fasting, and the Milky Way was peaceful. But in 1999, the Chandra Space Telescope detected a powerful signal from the galactic center. Station 34, Chandra OC. An explosion near the event horizon. Is this the beginning of a black hole binge? For trackers of the galactic center, the blast is a wake-up call. There was a hot piece of news. A remarkable fact for all of us was, for many years, how inactive the black hole was. And all of a sudden we saw, well, there's an object there which wasn't there before. Reinhard Genzel has been watching the galactic center for nearly two decades. Like Andrea Ghez, he's been tracking the orbits of stars, helping to prove the existence of a black hole at the heart of the Milky Way. Now both Genzel and Ghez will shift their focus and try to measure the black hole's appetite. One of the big mysteries about the black hole at the center of the galaxy is when we see emission matter falling onto the black hole, or rather the black hole eating up its surroundings. Genzel and Ghez are joining a worldwide effort. Chandra in orbit will take X-ray pictures of the galactic center. At the same time, five major observatories on the ground will probe the black hole, all trying to count calories. Genzel heads south to Chile, while Ghez and Becklin climb a mountaintop in Hawaii. Telescope time is precious. There's no room for mistakes. 
when you're there, uh, it's an incredible rush. I mean, you're very much on for the few nights um, that you're there, hoping the weather cooperates, hoping that the uh, the instrument cooperates. How's your four look on the oscilloscope? Does the timing look okay? Better now. Okay, let's see if there's something there. Madeline, we're ready to go. The teams have five short nights to find out how much the black hole is eating by measuring the energy that flares out. Zoom in a little bit more. All right, so first night. Doesn't look like we've got any flares. Chandra headquarters in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The first night turns up only noise. Four more chances, guys. Night two, Chile has problems. No, we have to redo the acquisition over here. Even if there are flares, the Chilean telescope can't see them. It was, uh, the correction was... Unstable. Uh, yeah, unstable. A patch of humidity is confusing the computers. The crucial adaptive optics aren't working and everything's a blur. Yeah. Okay, now we have a problem with the eight meter, with the main mirror, the eight meter mirror seems to be deformed. In Hawaii, it's not much better for Gez and her team. The galactic center is playing hide and seek behind overcast skies. We're fighting with clouds. It looked better just a moment ago, so it looked like, it looked like we were just ready to go, but now it's looking like, yep. The Hawaiian forecast predicts even more clouds tomorrow. The team is getting anxious. Finally, on night three, the German team's luck changes. Very incorrect. Look at this. Right. It's really scary. In Chile, they spot an outburst. That's the best fair event that we saw during this run. Definitely. A new point of light appears in the star field. One that wasn't there before. Very nice, very nice. Here we can clearly see a region between those two sources where there is no other object. And here we have the same region, the same two sources, and now in between we see an additional source. So this is the flaring state of Sagittarius A star. JPL Com, Chandra C. When the Chandra team downloads their data from space, they see it too. Ah. Oh, yeah. The X-rays show a spike that coincides with the German's flash of light. Genzel checks in with the Hawaiian team, but they're in the wrong time zone. News from our colleagues, of course, telling us that they are a few, few hours further west, so the sun hasn't even set yet. The galactic center hasn't risen above the Hawaiian horizon, and Gez has missed the flare. This part kills me, waiting. But the next night, Gez finally gets what he's looking for. Well, that image is a whole lot better. Really? Yeah. Really. So in fact, we can see this flaring activity where we think we're seeing matter fall into the black hole. And uh, just a few minutes later, it was absolutely gone. This now you see it, now you don't flash of light is an explosion of energy produced when matter rushes toward the black hole and some escapes. We were taking measurements and you didn't see anything from the, the black hole. All you saw was a star and then bam, it was there and bright. And 15 minutes later, it was gone. So that was our moment to make the measurement and it was extremely exciting to know that we'd actually been able to, to catch it. The teams are thrilled to capture a handful of flares at the heart of the Milky Way but they're just snacks. Nothing compared to the giant jets seen in distant galaxies. What's more, they're looking like rare events. There's simply not enough matter near our black hole to provide a large continuing feast. It seems, at least for now, the giant's plate is empty. Our black hole had a, uh, a wild teenage life. I'm pretty sure of that. It had jets, it threw a lot of matter out, it uh, had a grand old time, and now it's decayed into the old folks' home. But what would it take for the monster of the Milky Way to come out of retirement? Could explosive jets of energy blast across our galaxy in the future? 
tantalizing clues are turning up in the coldest place on Earth. A Smithsonian team is tuning into high-frequency radio signals from the galactic center. The best reception is at the South Pole. Not as nice as Hawaii, but the date is worth it. There's some of the gas falling in toward the black hole in the galactic center. Reading the radio signal, Antony Stark detects just small amounts of gas feeding the black hole. Nothing too serious. But farther out, about 400 light years from the galactic center, he can see signs of something much more alarming. A vast ring of matter is gradually growing bigger. This storage ring then builds up until it coagulates into a single gigantic cloud of about 30 million solar masses. When the ring reaches a tipping point, it will condense into a giant cloud, triggering a dramatic starburst event, a storm of stars forming and dying quickly. What's left of the gas cloud will spiral down into the grasp of the black hole which then rapidly spirals in and feeds the black hole in the galactic center, making the Milky Way an active galaxy. When the feasting starts, the fireworks will be seen across the Milky Way. But don't bother marking your calendar. Dinner time isn't scheduled for at least 10 million years. The Milky Way will survive its black hole's upcoming feast but it isn't likely to survive the threat further down the road. Galactic cannibalism. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, is not immune from these colliding galaxy scenarios. We've got neighbors. Two million light years away, our closest neighbor, the Andromeda Galaxy, is charging toward us at almost 700,000 miles per hour. We're falling towards each other and one day we will collide. Knowing the galaxy's dimensions and the laws of gravity. What our simulations show is what could happen basically in a, quite a few billion years from now when the two galaxies will actually approach each other and merge. The merger will take more than two billion years while the galaxies circle and entwine. Imagine what that might look like from another galaxy. You'll see two grand, beautiful spiral galaxies moving towards each other, slowly losing their shape. You'll see new avenues where stars and gas can funnel down towards this newly formed center, feeding this reborn monster. The collision will send a blizzard of stars and gas in all directions. Some will shoot toward the crowded core of the new galaxy, spurring massive explosions. In the process of merging, there will be a very strong starburst event occurring at the time of the merger as all of the gas is being funneled towards the center. Amid the turmoil, chances are our little solar system will either witness a spectacular show or be flung out of the galaxy into the voids of space. The Milky Way will be destroyed. But what about the black hole at its center? Most likely, it will merge with Andromeda's, a monster 50 times larger. Stars and galaxies may come and go, but supermassive black holes just get bigger. Once considered freaks of the cosmos, black holes are coming into their own, claiming their place center stage in a violent, changing universe. As we forge ahead in trying to understand how we came into being and how all of the matter got put down in the universe, uh, we can't leave black holes out of the picture because it seems they play a fundamental role on very, very large scales. Black holes not only wreak havoc upon the landscape in which they're embedded, they actively shape the landscape. 
So black holes are the kind of the spice of the universe. Black holes are a major player in the evolution of the things that light up our night sky. They are, in a sense, the secret shadows behind the waltz of the galaxy. Patrolling space like a sentry, the satellite telescope SWIFT is on constant lookout for cosmic disasters. And when it finds one, down on Earth, word spreads quickly. Every few days, the satellite spots a violent eruption in deep space, sending dozens of stargazers scrambling. Whether they're seasoned pros or high school amateurs, their goal is the same. Go to camera focus mode, and then we're gonna need to move the dome, Casey. To catch a glimpse of a star in its final death throes. Going supernova. And leaving in its wake, the strangest phenomenon in the cosmos. A black hole. Nothing survives encounters with black holes. The black hole wins. It wins every time. When something falls into a black hole, it's essentially gone from our universe. They rip stuff apart and eat them. And then they burp and they're ready for the next course. And now, evidence of something even more ominous. A new kind of black hole of unfathomable size and power. That's a big galaxy, and right down at the center, we think there's probably a black hole that's got a mass you know, that approaches a billion suns. Today, scientists are finding black holes are bigger, stronger, and more destructive than they ever imagined. It creates energy fields that would fry any life in its vicinity. Not only do they consume everything that comes near, you stick your finger down in there, you ain't getting it back. But their power may reach across galaxies and beyond. Did the universe really have to be made with these things in it? We'd like to think they're far, far away. But what if, in our own cosmic backyard, there lurks the monster of the Milky Way? Right now on Nova. Funding for NOVA is provided by the following. This is just enormous. As he pours over a set of x-rays, Brian McNamara struggles to diagnose a complicated ailment. So that's pretty strange. But his patient isn't a person or any earthly creature. It's a cluster of galaxies, two and a half billion light years away, with a giant blast of energy spewing from the center. This is the most powerful explosion in the universe since the Big Bang. To put this on sort of an Earth scale, it's equivalent to about a trillion, trillion, trillion atomic explosions. So it's an enormous amount of energy. What could produce such awesome power? Whatever it is, it seems to live at the very core of galaxies. And many believe our own galaxy, the Milky Way, is not immune, harboring a powerful secret at its heart. What could lie at the center of the Milky Way? One of the pioneering explorers of our galaxy is Eric Becklin. He's been trying to unlock the mysteries of the galactic center for more than 40 years. But first, he had to find it. Back then, 
People weren't even sure where the center was. There was some vague understanding. There was a radio source called Sagittarius A, a very strong radio source, but there was even debate whether that was really the center or not. Examining other distant galaxies, astronomers knew that the center is usually the brightest spot, tightly packed with stars. But when they tried to pinpoint the center of our own galaxy, the Milky Way, they ran into a problem. The central stars were shrouded by cosmic dust. There is so much dust between us and the galactic center, it is completely opaque. You do not see the stars in the galactic center. The most powerful telescopes cannot see it. But there are other kinds of light that can pass through like infrared, a form of light and heat invisible to the naked eye that travels in slightly longer waves. Infrared radiation gets through the dust because its wavelengths are longer and the dust just kind of rides on the infrared wave. In the 1960s, Becklin belonged to a Caltech team that bought an infrared detector from a military contractor and attached it to the end of a telescope. It was in August of 1966. I was up at Mount Wilson. It was a beautiful night on a small 24-inch telescope. And as we were looking uh, with the infrared detector, we were seeing more and more stars. A simple chart recorded the infrared light of stars, stars that until then had remained hidden behind a veil of dust and debris. This is a signal in the infrared, and each star gives you more signal. And we were building up, as we were getting closer to the center, more and more stars. We were actually seeing through the dust for the first time, and then came to a peak, and then back down again. And I knew immediately that that was the center of our Milky Way, and that I was the first person to actually see the star in the core of our galaxy. Located the heart of the Milky Way. From our perspective, an inconspicuous speck near the constellation Sagittarius. Where's a giant spiraling disk of hundreds of billions of stars, a hundred thousand light years from end to end. Our sun, about halfway out from the center, sits in the peaceful suburbs. But at the galaxy's core, the neighborhood gets more exciting and dangerous. There's a lot of gas. There's a lot of dust. This is absolutely the most crowded place in our galaxy. From Earth, we can see few thousand stars with the naked eye. If you went to the galactic center, there would be millions of stars filling the sky. It, it, it's the big time. It's where the show really goes on in the galaxy. And so if you go there, you're very much aware of being a, a tiny little mouse in Times Square and somebody's liable to step on you. For years, scientists suspected that a powerful force dominated this galactic Times Square. It had to come from an unimaginably massive object. Some thought it had to be a black hole. An object so strange, it's hard to describe. What's a black hole? It's a region of space. It's a point of infinite density. We don't know how to wrap our brains around that. Um, if you fall in, you never come out. It's not the point of no return, it's the sphere of no return. Now you throw in a hungry beast in the middle of it all. It's this monstrous, mysterious thing. And if you can imagine taking a bowling ball that, I don't know, eats everything, that's not true. <laughs> you have something, you drop it off the top of a building, and you're falling in to the deepest well you can possibly imagine. Physicists have just as hard a time as anybody else understanding this sort of thing. It's a black hole. There's no other phrase we can possibly use to describe it. The current idea of this bizarre creature comes from a radical view of space, time, and gravity. 
Welcome to the universe according to Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein had this crazy idea that space and time were curved, and it was the curvature of space that gave the appearance of gravity. We tend to think of space as rigid and stable, but Einstein proposed that space and time are woven together in a flexible fabric. Massive objects like the sun actually bend and warp the fabric of space-time, creating troughs that smaller objects can fall into. What actually happens is matter warps space-time. So the very space, the three-dimensional space that we walk through, warps slightly. Every warps in on me ever so slightly, but because we're not very massive, it's so minuscule that we don't sense it. If an object is massive enough, like the Earth, it will warp space-time so we can sense it and fall towards it. That's gravity. But what happens if an object is much, much more massive than the Earth or the Sun? In theory, it could warp the fabric so much it would create an actual hole in space-time. Once something fell in, it couldn't escape. Not even light itself. So imagine a place where the gravity is so strong, turning on a flashlight. The light would go up and it would never leave. It would curve and come back down just the way a tossed ball on Earth is not traveling fast enough. It goes up, curves, and comes back down. Space itself is falling inside the black hole. It's rather like a, a river falling over a waterfall. It's like that, except it's space itself that's falling over the cliff. There's a place where the space starts moving faster than light. So the light, which is trying to get out, it's rather like a kayak trying to make their way upstream on a river that's going too fast. They get dragged down to the center of the black hole. Gravity becomes a riptide. The closer you get, the stronger the current. Eventually, you reach the event horizon, the point of no return. Deep inside, whatever goes in is lost in a point of infinite density. The matter goes inside the surface of the black hole, shrinks down to the very center where it gets destroyed in a region of infinite warp space and time, and it's gone. And so, it seems, are the laws of physics. At the center of a black hole, all equations break down. Even for physicists, what happens deep inside a black hole is a mystery. We're in want of a new idea about how to explain what matter does at the center of a black hole. We're in need of a new law of physics. Einstein himself concluded black holes were too strange to be real. Albert never really liked the idea of black holes. He thought they were anathema. This was something that nature should avoid the places where space and time became infinitely On clear summer nights, we have long watched in awe as a broad band of light rose up across the sky. Now we know that behind this luminous veil of gas and stars, a restless universe is being shaped by shattering collisions. Explosions. And shock waves. Two groups of astronomers are tracking a star that has accelerated to mind-boggling speeds. They believe it holds clues to the origin and nature of a mysterious object that's lurking deep within the galaxy. What are they learning about the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way?
to observers in distant space, our Milky Way galaxy would look something like this. A flat spiral with vast arcs of gas, dust, and about 200 billion stars swirling around it. The center, bulging up and out of the galactic disk, is tightly packed with stars. Thick dust and blinding starlight have long obscured our view of the mysterious inner regions of the bulge. And yet, the clues had been piling up that something important, something strange, is lurking there. The first to take notice was the physicist Carl Jansky back in the 1930s. He had been asked by his employer, Bell Telephone Labs, to investigate sources of static that might interfere with what it saw as the killer app of its time, radio voice transmissions. Using this ungainly radio receiver, Jansky methodically scanned the airwaves. He traced most of the static to thunderstorms, nearby and far away. There was one signal he could not explain. It was a hiss of radio noise that sounded like steam. Jansky narrowed it to a region in the sky, the constellation of Sagittarius, in the direction of the center of the galaxy. Located within a larger pattern of radio emissions, Jansky's source would become known as Sagittarius A. Word of Jansky's finding got out. He assured the public that it was not aliens seeking contact. Whether it was or wasn't, no one could really say for the next three decades. Then a young astronomer named Eric Becklin got interested in probing deeper into the galactic center. Sagittarius rises right about there. First comes Scorpio around midnight, and then Sagittarius and the very big Milky Way and the very Becklin core of the Becklin is galaxy one of those rare right researchers whose curiosity and determination push our understanding to a whole new level. It was the 1960s, and astronomy, like society, was in a period of ferment. Astronomers were peering into ever more distant corners of the universe, looking for answers to a whole new set of questions. When Eric began his career, a class of extremely powerful radio beacons called quasars had just been discovered in distant space. What powerful objects were generating them? Did they come from the bright centers of galaxies, as some astronomers suspected? To look into the center of another galaxy, you have to pinpoint its precise location. Young Becklin first took aim at our luminous neighbor, Andromeda. In this recent ultraviolet image, you can see a dense glow in the middle. Becklin found the point where the light reaches peak intensity and marked it as the center. From our orientation in space, the Andromeda galaxy is in full view. But our galaxy is a different story. We live inside it. To pinpoint its center, Becklin had to find a way to see through all the dust and gas that obscure our line of sight. He went to a military contractor and obtained a device that reads infrared light. Its wavelengths are similar 
to the distances between particles in a dust cloud, which allow it to move right through the dust. Looking toward the galactic center, Becklin began measuring the brightness of infrared light as it rose to a peak, marking its exact location. Thus began Becklin's long quest to see what lies deep in the Milky Way's heart. Be a black hole here. Because people at that time but thought, he well, wasn't the only the astronomer the interested in the galactic center. Sergei Star was over there. Sergei Star can be a black hole. Now we know, of course. Reinhard Genso and a team a a based at the you know, Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics in Germany a began a similar chance. campaign in 1990. More than a fighting chance. The German group came to the mountains of Chile and South America to use the recently christened New Technology Telescope of the European Southern Observatory. A few years later, in 1993, high atop Hawaii's Mauna Kea volcano, Eric Becklin and colleagues, including Andrea Gates, began using the giant new 10-meter Keck telescope. The American and German groups shared the same goal, to identify the source of radiation first observed by Carl Jansky. They found that most of the energy is coming from a region they called Sagittarius A star. This is our road map, and that's the center of our galaxy. That is too small and dim to actually see. That was not true of stars that are orbiting around it. Tracking the precise locations of these stars would take the sensitivity of Keck's wide aperture. You can ask, how well can we position stars in our field of view? And it's... Um, we can position things to two centimeters in LA if, as viewed from New York. So you can basically tell somebody's um, waving like this with their finger in okay. Los Angeles as viewed from New York. It's powerful enough to detect an object with the luminosity of a candle on the moon. Meanwhile, Astronomers had focused the new Hubble Space Telescope on a different galaxy. A giant elliptical cloud made up of nearly a trillion stars, 50 million light years away, called M87. They tracked gas whipping around its center at speeds of almost 2 million kilometers per hour. That led them to calculate the mass of the gravitational source at M87 center at four billion times that of our sun. This measurement, the first of its kind, pointed to the presence of a black hole of truly supermassive proportions. But that did not conclusively prove its identity. If a supermassive black hole lay at the center of our galaxy, the German and American teams each hoped that Earth's proximity would allow them to assemble conclusive evidence. Their search was part of a larger effort to map the layout of our galaxy and find clues to its history. Astronomers were eager to train a new generation of space telescopes, the Great Observatories, on the Galactic Center. Using Hubble, astronomers documented vast arcs of gas heated up by ferocious winds from large stars. Capturing infrared light, the Spitzer Space Telescope picked up the swirling heat signatures of dense star concentrations. 
The Chandra X-ray Observatory recorded multiple sources of high-energy radiation, most likely given off by ultra-dense neutron stars and small black holes. Based on Chandra data, scientists estimated that a swarm of 20,000 black holes likely inhabits the inner three light years of the galactic center. So the gravity of the black hole attracts gas, attracts stars, and in fact attracts also things like neutron stars and maybe stellar black holes. Very unlike the situation we're used to where we have one sun in that direction, that's it. There will be stars all around us and very massive stars, lots of radiation. It would be very, I mean, we couldn't exist there. There's lots of ultraviolet radiation. X-rays are floating around, gas clouds bash into each other. And then, of course, the black hole itself, from time to time, accretes material and then releases radiation. So it's a very hostile environment, really. To conclusively prove there's a supermassive black hole in the center, the teams would have to prove that it's confined to a very small region and that it has enough gravity to whip the stars orbiting it to high speeds. The light of these stars travels 26,000 light years to reach us, only to be blurred in the last few kilometers as it hits the Earth's atmosphere. So both teams turned to new methods designed to sharpen the light. 16 is right, right there. here, yeah. The idea was to snap thousands of pictures in a short time. Because the atmosphere is in motion, a star's apparent position may shift from image to image. To pinpoint the star's true location, a computer averages the positions and looks for correlations in the wavelength of the star's light. The first few years' data allowed the teams to calculate the speeds of these stars and their rough trajectories around the center. Keep our fingers crossed. That allowed them to narrow the position of their target and to calculate the strength of its gravitational pull. That gave them its mass, roughly three million times that of our sun. Because no other single object is known to weigh that much, it was strong evidence of a black hole. But it was still not ironclad proof. Their data, for example, didn't rule out a dense concentration of stars packed into the center, held there by their mutual gravity. The proof the team sought would come in the wake of an extraordinary event. In the early years of the new century, large telescopes around the world began to install upgrades. Most large new telescope mirrors these days are thin, designed to be mounted on metal scaffolding. Behind the mirrors, engineers install pistons and motors to subtly correct the shape of the glass as changing temperatures deform it. Or as atmospheric turbulence blurs the incoming light. To these adaptive optic systems, they added lasers, designed to project an artificial star onto the upper atmosphere. As turbulence distorts its light, a computer subtracts the same degree of distortion from the light of the real stars bringing them back into focus. This is a Keck telescope image of the galactic center. Without adaptive optics applied, and with it, 
This increase in sharpness allowed the teams to see what happened in 2002. The German team had begun making observations from the new very large telescope array at the Paranal Observatory in northern Chile. In the spring of that year, one of the stars they had been following, known as S2, made a dramatic move. S2 suddenly swooped around the center, accelerating to an astonishing 18 million kilometers per hour. The American team saw it too. It had come incredibly close to the suspected black hole about three times the distance between the Sun and Pluto. If there had been a cluster of stars in there, S2's path and its light would have wobbled. It did not. This was the evidence the teams had sought. It showed that Sagittarius A star is a single object. Without doubt, it could now be called a black hole. This observation came at a time when astronomers had begun to believe that supermassive black holes play an active role in the evolution of galaxies. They had found that they occupy the centers of nearly every large galaxy. In fact, the larger the galaxy, the larger the black hole. That suggests that the two must have evolved hand in hand, each shaping the life story of the other. As matter flows into a black hole, it heats up to millions of degrees. Despite the black hole's intense gravity, much of the inflowing matter blows off in fierce winds and shoots out in powerful jets that roar out of its poles. The more matter that rushes in, the more the black hole pushes back out. The force and heat from an active black hole can have the effect of limiting a galaxy's growth by slowing star birth and by pushing gas out of its central region. As a result, a strict relationship has developed between the size of the black hole and the size of the galactic bulge that surrounds it. The astronomers wanted to know, is the Milky Way's own supermassive black hole still active and growing? Or has it gone dormant? Just as the black hole that Sagittarius A star revealed its existence, it would show its true colors. The year 2001. Scientists were beginning to work with the recently launched Chandra X-ray Space Telescope. They pointed it at Sagittarius A star. And by chance, at that moment, the black hole erupted. The teams on the ground began focusing on it for longer periods, hoping to see it happen again. And so they did. They saw what are now thought to be flares, outbursts that take place when matter builds up near the event horizon. When it falls in, around once an Earth day, the black hole lights up. Okay, here we can clearly see a region between those two sources where there is no other object. And here we have the same region, the same two sources, and now in between we see an additional source. So this is a flaring state of Sagittarius A star. 
as gas, gas clouds, if you like, come in, they sort of spiral into this innermost regions and get ever hotter before they disappear. And in the very innermost region, just before it disappears from our side, that's where they would be the hottest. And so an accretion event, think of it sort of a clump, falls into the, falls into the center. Could also look like that. A group of astronomers is now making plans to get a closer look at these flares and perhaps to directly glimpse the black hole. From Earth, it is but the size of a grapefruit on the moon. No single telescope on Earth has enough resolution to see something so small, so far away. Astronomers think that they will be able to see it by linking observatories around the world to create what amounts to an Earth-sized radio telescope known as the Event Horizon Telescope. This simulation shows what they expect to see. A supermassive black hole in silhouette, framed by eruptions on its surface that travel around the monster as it spins. The reason that this periodicity, the fact that things change um, uh, repetitively in the, same, in the same way over a certain time scale, um, is that the material's orbiting the black hole. And so this time scale corresponds to the time it takes to go completely around the black hole. And so that also tells you how close it is to the black hole. And the, the key here is that if the black hole's not rotating, if there's no rotating, the shortest period that you should be able to detect is about 24 minutes. So if it is rotating and you think it is coming from the secretion disk, then um, that's telling you that the, the black hole's spinning because material can get closer if it's spinning faster. Meanwhile, astronomers have mounted a major effort to map the turbulent environment of Sagittarius A star, to shed light on the monster's current state and how it might change. The great space observatories, Hubble, Spitzer, and Chandra, combine to produce the most detailed image yet of the galactic center. In this image, the central zone, 160 light years across, stretches out like a vast claw. Sagittarius A star is the X-ray hot region on the lower wrist. Out on the hand is a dense grouping of about a thousand stars, called the Arches Cluster. It formed just a few million years ago. Only its tight formation saves it from being torn apart by the intense tidal forces at the center. Below is the Quintuplet Cluster, with the largest star documented in the Milky Way. The pistol star weighs in at 150 times the mass of the Sun. Large stars like these generate fierce winds of plasma that fill the galactic center. They should provide a steady diet for the black hole and cause it to glow brightly. Monitoring X-ray emissions with Chandra Telescope, astronomers found that these and other large stars are just a little too far away to feed the monster. As gas swirls in, a portion heats up and pushes outward. This outward wind is enough to block much of what's flowing in. So what would cause it to flare up? A separate study suggested that what's falling in is not gas, but comets and asteroids that have been stripped away from stars whose orbits had brought them in close.
this is the center of the cluster. And, you know, Sergei Star Wars over there. The yeah, black hole remains well, in a state of semi-retirement. But nevertheless, this is a bit of a puzzle that there are so many of the blue stars. Will it become the... active again? Working in the cold, clear air of the Antarctic, one group of radio astronomers surveyed the broader region surrounding the galactic center. Data from their South Pole telescope contained signs that a spectacular flare-up is slowly materializing. A huge ring of gas looms beyond the galactic center. When it accumulates some 300 million solar masses worth of matter, it will reach a tipping point the cloud will begin to funnel into a second ring that orbits close to the center. This inner ring will condense, then erupt with star formation, before spiraling down toward the ravenous black hole. As the cloud falls into it, the black hole will erupt in a blaze of glory visible across much of the universe. Don't wait around for it. Such outbursts happen every 400 million years or so. There is another much smaller cloud that is now on a black hole rendezvous. The cloud, weighing several times the mass of Earth, approached ground zero. This simulation shows the cloud passing within less than a fifth of a light year. It stretched out as the black hole began ripping it apart. Its momentum will carry most of it swirling past the black hole. In time, it will settle into an orbit, and slowly but surely, collapse into the center. Meanwhile, on a rocky outpost, 25,000 light years from the turmoil of the galactic center, astronomers continue to watch for surprises. They have found ways to track patterns of change shaping our universe over billions of years' time. And yet, it's often the small and sudden events that feed their sense of wonder. Since they started their work, these groups became the first to witness an object making a complete orbit around the center of the galaxy. The star S2 does it every 16 Earth years. Its dimmer cousin, S102, goes around every 11.5 years. No doubt, over the course of their next orbits, we'll answer many of the questions that swirl around their companion, the supermassive black hole. How did it form and shape the galaxy that surrounds it? Will it one day, from the dim heart of the Milky Way, become bright and powerful enough to light up the universe? To observers in distant space, our Milky Way galaxy would look something like this. A flat spiral with vast arcs of gas, dust, and about 200 billion stars swirling around it. The center, bulging up and out of the galactic disk, is tightly packed with stars. Thick dust and blinding starlight have long obscured our view of the mysterious inner regions of the bulge. 
And yet, the clues had been piling up that something important, something strange, is lurking there. The first to take notice was the physicist Carl Jansky, back in the 1930s. He had been asked by his employer, Bell Telephone Labs, to investigate sources of static that might interfere with what it saw as the killer app of its time. Radio voice transmissions. Using this ungainly radio receiver, Jansky methodically scanned the airwaves. He traced most of the static to thunderstorms, nearby and far away. There was one signal he could not explain. It was a hiss of radio noise that sounded like steam. Jansky narrowed it to a region in the sky, the constellation of Sagittarius, in the direction of the center of the galaxy. Located within a larger pattern of radio emissions, Jansky's source would become known as Sagittarius A. Word of Jansky's finding got out. He assured the public that it was not aliens seeking contact. Whether it was or wasn't, no one could really say for the next three decades. Then a young astronomer named Eric Becklin got interested in probing deeper into the galactic center. Sagittarius rises right about there. First comes Scorpio around midnight and then Sagittarius and the very big Milky Way and the very Backlund core of the galaxy. is one of those rare right researchers whose curiosity and determination push our understanding to a whole new level. It was the 1960s and astronomy, like society, was in a period of ferment. Astronomers were peering into ever more distant corners of the universe looking for answers to a whole new set of questions. When Eric began his career, a class of extremely powerful radio beacons called quasars had just been discovered in distant space. What powerful objects were generating them? Did they come from the bright centers of galaxies, as some astronomers suspected? To look into the center of another galaxy, you have to pinpoint its precise location. Young Becklin first took aim at our luminous neighbor, Andromeda. In this recent ultraviolet image, you can see a dense glow in the middle. Becklin found the point where the light reaches peak intensity and marked it as the center. From our orientation in space, the Andromeda galaxy is in full view. But our galaxy is a different story. We live inside it. To pinpoint its center, Becklin had to find a way to see through all the dust and gas that obscure our line of sight. He went to a military contractor and obtained a device that reads infrared light. Its wavelengths are similar to the distances between particles in a dust cloud, which allow it to move right through the dust. Looking toward the galactic center, Becklin began measuring the brightness of infrared light as it rose to a peak, marking its exact location. Thus began Becklin's long quest to see what lies deep in the Milky Way's heart. Be a black hole him, because people at that time. But he well, wasn't the only the astronomer interested in the galactic center. Star was over there. 
So that your star can be a black hole. Now we know, of course. Reinhard Genser and a team a a based at the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics in Germany a began a similar chance. campaign in 1990. More than a fighting chance. The German group came to the mountains of Chile and South America to use the recently christened New Technology Telescope of the European Southern Observatory. A few years later, in 1993, high atop Hawaii's Mauna Kea volcano, Eric Becklin and colleagues, including Andrea Gates, began using the giant new 10-meter Keck telescope. The American and German groups shared the same goal, to identify the source of radiation first observed by Carl Jansky. They found that most of the energy is coming from a region they called Sagittarius A star. This is our road map, and that's the center of our galaxy. That is too small and dim to actually see. That was not true of stars that are orbiting around it. Tracking the precise locations of these stars would take the sensitivity of Keck's wide aperture. You can ask, how well can we position stars in our field of view? And it's... Um, we can position things to two centimeters in LA if, as viewed from New York. So you can basically tell somebody's um, waving like this with their finger in okay. Los Angeles as viewed from New York. It's powerful enough to detect an object with the luminosity of a candle on the moon. Meanwhile, Astronomers had focused the new Hubble Space Telescope on a different galaxy. A giant elliptical cloud made up of nearly a trillion stars, 50 million light years away, called M87. They tracked gas whipping around its center at speeds of almost 2 million kilometers per hour. That led them to calculate the mass of the gravitational source at M87 center at four billion times that of our sun. This measurement, the first of its kind, pointed to the presence of a black hole of truly supermassive proportions. But that did not conclusively prove its identity. If a supermassive black hole lay at the center of our galaxy, the German and American teams each hoped that Earth's proximity would allow them to assemble conclusive evidence. Their search was part of a larger effort to map the layout of our galaxy and find clues to its history. Astronomers were eager to train a new generation of space telescopes, the Great Observatories, on the Galactic Center. Using Hubble, astronomers documented vast arcs of gas heated up by ferocious winds from large stars. Capturing infrared light, the Spitzer Space Telescope picked up the swirling heat signatures of dense star concentrations. The Chandra X-ray Observatory recorded multiple sources of high-energy radiation, most likely given off by ultra-dense neutron stars and small black holes. Based on Chandra data, scientists estimated that a swarm of 20,000 black holes likely inhabits the inner three light years of the galactic center. So the gravity of the black hole attracts gas, attracts stars, and in fact, attracts also things like neutron stars and maybe stellar black holes. 
very unlike the situation we're used to where we have one sun in that direction, that's it. There will be stars all around us and very massive stars, lots of radiation. It would be very, I mean, we couldn't exist there. There's lots of ultraviolet radiation. X-rays are floating around, gas clouds bash into each other. And then, of course, the black hole itself, from time to time, accretes material and then releases radiation. So it's a very hostile environment, really. To conclusively prove there's a supermassive black hole in the center, the teams would have to prove that it's confined to a very small region and that it has enough gravity to whip the stars orbiting it to high speeds. The light of these stars travels 26,000 light years to reach us, only to be blurred in the last few kilometers as it hits the Earth's atmosphere. So both teams turn to new methods designed to sharpen the light. 16 is right in here, yeah. The idea was to snap thousands of pictures in a short time. Because the atmosphere is in motion, a star's apparent position may shift from image to image. To pinpoint the star's true location, a computer averages the positions and looks for correlations in the wavelength of the star's light. The first few years' data allowed the teams to calculate the speeds of these stars and their rough trajectories around the center. Keep our fingers crossed. That allowed them to narrow the position of their target and to calculate the strength of its gravitational pull. That gave them its mass, roughly three million times that of our sun. Because no other single object is known to weigh that much, it was strong evidence of a black hole. But it was still not ironclad proof. Their data, for example, didn't rule out a dense concentration of stars packed into the center, held there by their mutual gravity. The proof the team sought would come in the wake of an extraordinary event. In the early years of the new century, large telescopes around the world began to install upgrades. Most large new telescope mirrors these days are thin designed to be mounted on metal scaffolding. Behind the mirrors, engineers install pistons and motors to subtly correct the shape of the glass as changing temperatures deform it. Or as atmospheric turbulence blurs the incoming light. To these adaptive optic systems, they added lasers, designed to project an artificial star onto the upper atmosphere. As turbulence distorts its light, a computer subtracts the same degree of distortion from the light of the real stars, bringing them back into focus. This is a Keck telescope image of the galactic center. Without adaptive optics applied, and with it, this increase in sharpness allowed the teams to see what happened in 2002. The German team had begun making observations from the new Very Large Telescope Array at the Paranal Observatory in northern Chile. In the spring of that year, one of the stars they had been following, known as S2, made a dramatic move. S2 suddenly swooped around the center 
accelerating to an astonishing 18 million kilometers per hour. The American team saw it too. It had come incredibly close to the suspected black hole, about three times the distance between the Sun and Pluto. If there had been a cluster of stars in there, S2's path and its light would have wobbled. It did not. This was the evidence the teams had sought.